big libraries here. This might be true of your collections as well. So 90% of the traffic to the provincial collection is direct. So this means that only 10% of traffic is coming from library websites. So they're either going straight to the app, which would Libby, probably, um, or they're going straight just to the, the collection website. So when we are thinking about how we market our collections, how we are uh, putting together our recommended reads list, but it, it is good to be cognizant of the fact that, you know, check and see if it is 90% for your library, um, it is 90% for those of us who are part of the provincial collection. Uh, that center group of icons is the number of recommended library titles we had as of uh, June 14th, uh, 5,205 with uh, 38 titles which had five or more recommendations. So um, provincially, um, turning on that recommended library really good. We are getting um, more books uh, recommended by our communities and then we're responding to that as selectors as well which might you know have something to do with how healthy the collection is doing right now. And then the third icon uh, there references all the new users that we had in 2018. So um, that is brand new users who've never used the collection before so over almost 13,000 people. And the other thing I looked at when I was looking at this stat was sort of the number of unique uh, users we're seeing every month. So between uh, 2018 and 2019 on a month-to-month -month basis, we're seeing a 25% increase in unique users. So there are a lot of new people who are coming to our digital collections and we are not seeing a slowdown in growth. Speaking of which, thank you to everyone who replied to my call for stats. Uh, so uh, I reached out uh, to a number of local libraries who I thought would give me a bit of a time and share some of their increases between 2017 and 2018 around their digital collections. So and a big thank you to Natalie who told me all the trends that might impact circulation. Uh, this is all for her. So uh, to note here is that in 2017 was when Libby was introduced, which is the app for OverDrive that hopefully everyone is using now. And that RB Digital introduced their brand new sort of app experience in 2017 as well. So since 2017, we've really seen a growth and improvement in the user experience. And since Zinio was much more popular than our RB collection, you know, merging those two experiences definitely, I think, had a positive impact on the circulation with that resource as well. Um, <clears throat> a bit more generally um, in the marketplace is that, oops, I want this to be a touch screen and it's not. <laughs> oh no. Um, let's just see if this works. Is my screen still staying stay up? There we go. Um, Ebook sales have sort of settled down um, in growth. So right now in the US, 12% of sales um, for in the publishing industry is about the number of ebook sales right now. And in Canada, it's about 17% at the moment. Um, Whereas um, we're not quite there, I think, with most libraries as a percentage of circulation of our full uh, collections, but we're getting pretty close. Um, and definitely the library marketplace is not anywhere near settled. So when people are saying like every uh, month, you know, the Association of American Publishers comes out and says, ebook sales revenue is declining. That's not what we're seeing in libraries and sort of trying to um, look at that in a way that you can say this is what my library does isn't quite an accurate picture to paint. So um, up on the screen here, um, some neat things. So VPL last year, uh, which we'll be talking about later, launched a uh, fast read was called Library, which might have been uh, had something to do with their increases since I did a similar slide last year. Uh, since 2016, VPL's audiobook uh, circulation went up by over 64%, which is like, <laughs> like it's amazing. Absolutely incredible uh, to see numbers like this. So there are increases between 2015 or 2016, 17, and now in there. The increases have been quite uh, steady and like really, really big when you sort of look at a two-year snapshot instead of just a one-year snapshot. Um, for Fraser Valley, next on the list, they did cease their cloud library in October 2018, so we might not see the full impact of that change this year. But going to next year, um, we might expect to see something a bit. Uh, different, but again, huge numbers. Uh, New West uh, on there, uh, again, same sort of increases year to year from last year, which it for means for them over 30% increase in ebook circulation over two years. Um, 
North Bend City Library. Uh, Kat and I looked at these numbers and sort of went, hmm, that's interesting. Uh, so I know that uh, they've made some changes. Uh, they switched over to exclusive cloud library in 2017. Um, so I think that there's still a bit of settling to do in the community with their statistics. Uh, West Van is the second to last on the list there. And last year, I was really embarrassed because our increases were not nearly as good as everyone else's. Um, and in the past year, we've really worked on marketing. So since we're an Advantage Library, um, we've been able to update our book lists uh, for our uh, sort of front-facing collection every two weeks. And we think that has a lot to do with why our increases have improved a lot from the previous year. Um, that bi-weekly switch up uh, definitely has had an impact to it. And uh, North Bend District Public Library uh, doesn't separate out their stats, but they are again seeing really big changes. Like I don't know if there's any other um, portions of our collections that are seeing these consistent increases um, across the board. So good job everyone. This is really, really exciting. So I'm going to bring down the mood. Uh, and now I can't switch over to the next one. Why, Mac, why? Um, so last year I noted that it looked like collection sizes were decreasing in size when looking at the provincial stats. And um, some of this could have been attributed to libraries switching their platforms, because uh, that can end up with uh, titles being lost. But also we're most definitely losing access to content we're staying on the same platform. So um, when I wrote this last week, I was like, four out of the big five publishers have restrictive licensing models. Now I can say five out of the five big publishers have restrictive licensing models. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so Hachette uh, Book Group just announced this week that they're also moving to a two-year model of metered access. And the thing to think about here is that when we're balancing our budgets and trying to think about maintaining a title after two years on the sort of long side versus the, the 12 month option up there. So after two years, are you gonna rebuy that title? Or are you gonna buy one of the hundreds of new titles that come out every month um, when they cost a lot of money? Um, and what does this do to our back catalog? What does this do to our series? What does this do to our patrons that find a new author? Um, and want to read everything they've ever written. Uh, this really has a kind of a, a really chilling impact to me. This is what really affected me when I thought about it. I, I took a look and like, you know, very solid staples of a series collection. Authors like Stuart Woods and Anne Bishop and Heather Graham, they're all metered access titles. They all write a lot of series and series that it kind of matters to have all the books in the series um, available. And um, I was sort of thinking of those early 2000 bookstores where you only had the most recent book in the series available to you. And I don't think that's something that public libraries want to be. And so um, this is one of my sort of chilling notes to think about, but it is it is a huge impact. It is something we should be bringing up to our boards. It is something that um, I know Kulk has been talking about a lot and since we might not get a Kulk update later, but definitely this is something we definitely should be talking about a lot to as many different people um, we can. The second half of my call to action is um, thinking about collections a little bit more locally. So our most popular titles undisputably are those big five published titles, but do they have to be? So there's a lot of collection development tools out there that focus on local. Um, if you aren't using Read Local BC for whatever part of the collection you're involved with, it is an absolutely excellent uh, tool. I use it monthly for um, so the ebook purchasing I do, um, and the only drawback is that not all these titles are available digitally. And there's one title uh, that's really popular, Moccasin Square Gardens, that's been available for pre-order since February, and the availability date every week switches. So it's still sitting in a cart, waiting to be purchased. Um, so that is, you know, but one title out of all the other ones that I've been able to to grab for us. Um, the other thing is that, at least for um, overdrive libraries, it is really easy to put together a search and just pull open locally published authors. The other thing I did on here, popularity across libraries as the sort, and I hope it's big enough uh, for people to see, um, but we have a title here, a Canada Reads Choice, um, you know, something that is $16 per copy, at one copy, one user. Um, the province has 
uh, seven copies. Uh, Advantage libraries have bought additional copies. And it's much easier to sort of say, oh, this is a popular book. I'm much happier to buy more than one copy of it if it's only 16 bucks. Um, and it is, you know, getting used, getting polls put on it. It is, it is an active title. So we do have local authors that are quality authors. They are Canadian, you know, more Canada. Um, and I think worthwhile. The other thing is that there are a number of really important titles out there that might not be available through those larger publishing houses. So through the self-published uh, sort of portal um, on Overdrive, you get some titles that are just from you know tinier um, distributors because they might not have sort of the infrastructure to go themselves. And both Smashwords and Book Baby for those small publishing houses or those that are self-publishing um, are really valuable. You can't find this through the regular search. You have to switch to self-published in order to buy these two titles that are featured here, which I hopefully every library has. Um, and it is getting increasingly easy to get more local content in there. Um, Lex Ben has worked with Overdrive around our Kids Tell Your Story program where kids are producing their own EPUBs and then we can integrate them into our collection quite easily. Um, so that was really nice to be like, oh, this isn't as hard as we thought. Um, and since 90% of our traffic uh, happens here, I'm not calling out BPL, don't think that this is a really pretty self-published uh, collection. Um, if 90% of our traffic is going direct to platform, what does it mean when we are um, sort of hiving off our content? They're very different collection development policies to have uh, these sorts of choices made. And I've sat through many an argument uh, with a bunch of very, very smart people about why we would separate them. Um, but it is when you're thinking about discovery and adoption of collections, you know, what are we doing and, and how do we make sure these, these books are getting discovered? Our local content, how is that getting discovered? Uh, <clears throat> there is also recently a report that came out, I think at the end of last year, called More Canada about the Canadian publishing industry, which has a number of calls to action both for digital content and physical content about how to get um, books purchased more often from Canadian bookstores, um, independently owned bookstores, uh, and how to get more Canadian content into collections because uh, Canadian books are in decline. The sales of Canadian books by Canadian authors are in decline, and how can we fix that? So um, I highly recommend if you guys just look up more Canada report, uh, definitely one to, to take a look at. Um, and how else can we, other than through selection, um, help adjust how our communities read. You know, um, a lot of library workers are readers advisory specialists, and uh, can they recommend titles to their community that are, are local and that match things? So if you are a John Grisham fan, you know, something else that you might like is, um, and choose something a bit more local. Uh, can we focus on publishers with better terms? You know, do we have to throw all of our money at uh, 12 month, $17 uh, licenses? Or can we reward publishers with the better terms? Can we, for our one book, one communities, or our featured book lists, or our book club titles, again, think about you know one of the criteria uh, that we could consider for those um, books is that they have to have a license that's good. So for even a, a smaller library to say, we're not going to choose um, a, a book that doesn't have a good licensing model, you know, has an impact and something that we could take when we are discussing uh, sort of publishing in, in the greater universe. And um, generally, as much as like I read big name authors all the time, they don't necessarily need us to do hard sells on them. They're going to do well um, because they are in the, the greater uh, world. But you know, the Canadian authors do, and they are having much better licensing terms for us. So can we reward that? Um, and definitely given budgetary constraints um, and all this sort of constraints that we have around these licensing models with the disappearing content, um, I, I, my call to action would be to, to think local um, and better serve our communities that way. So that's it. Oh, no, that's not going to be it for me. There we go. That's it for me. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. I, I do have a monthly e-newsletter on ebook and e-reader news, which also covers self-publishing audiobooks and everything else. Comes with commentary. Um, just shoot me an email if you'd like to be added. Um, and if you have any thoughts about what I've said today, I welcome either an in-person discussion or online if that would work better for folks. 
Um, and thank you again so much for having me here.